Okay, so um, welcome again to the orientation. Um, first, we're going to introduce ourselves, and I guess um, we'll, we'll start in the order of the pictures. Don't worry, there's just three of us today. Um, Paula, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Paula Winky, and welcome everyone to Stark Talk Clap. I'm a professor in, at Michigan State University in the Second Language Studies PhD program and in the Department of Linguistics, Languages, and Cultures. And um, I teach language assessment here at Michigan State University, and I also edit the journal Language Testing. And um, testing is my career, and I'm excited to have all of you join us for these four weeks and also into the fall and January, February, some components that are optional will be uh, going on then. So uh, great to see everyone. And I can introduce myself. I'm a um, Russian lead instructor here, but I'm just a facilitator. So I'll, I'll help the Russian participants, Arabic participants, if I can, of course. I don't speak Arabic. Um, so I'm a PhD candidate in the Second Language Studies program with Liz and Paula. And um, I do teach Russian. I do teach English, teacher education courses. And I'm very excited about this Star Talk, actually, because it uh, it's my first teaching job in the United States was in Star Talk in 2013, and um, I'm also a graduate of the Star Talk um, Teacher Development Program at Kent State University. So I'm very excited to be back. It's a shame it's online, but we don't really have a choice. So that's what I'm going to do. All right, and um, I'm Liz Huntley, or Elizabeth, being my full name. Um, like Diva, I'm also a, a PhD candidate in the Second Language Studies program at Michigan State University. Uh, my focus is in Arabic and specifically um, how we can improve teaching a spoken colloquial Arabic alongside standard Arabic. Um, I, I love that. I, I also love teaching. Um, I, like Dima, have taught in a couple of different Star Talk programs. Um, both in language programs as well as in teacher programs. And um, actually, Alette here today <laughs> was a student in the very first Star Talk teacher program I ever taught in. And now she is my director in a student program that I will be working in after this. Um, so yeah, it is, it's all coming full circle. And um, yeah, it is a great opportunity for you guys. A lot of really good resources out there. Um, so in addition to the three of us, we also have, as you've seen, um, a couple of guest lecturers. All of them are affiliated with Michigan State University, um, and they are going to be presenting on topics that are tangential to testing, but certainly um, that we want to take into consideration when we are thinking about assessment in our classrooms. And um, we won't introduce all of them right now. You'll, you've seen them on the schedule and you'll be meeting them throughout the weeks of this course. Um, but yes, that, that is us. So we wanted to start with some community norms just to set expectations for everybody. Um, the first one is that um, with a camera, you can leave it on as you see fit. Um, it's no problem if you need to turn it off. You know, we're all, we're all adults. Um, for many of us, it's at the end of a long day. And yeah, we, we understand that you might need to eat or do, do whatever it is that you need to do. So um, please, please don't worry about whether or not you have your camera on or off. Um, we do ask that when you're not speaking, please mute the microphone just so that it doesn't create background noise and making it more difficult for other people to hear. Um, fourth bullet point, life happens, we get it. Um, all of us this year have experienced a collapse of our work worlds and our home lives as we have to work from home and um, of course, that comes with all these other demands of things that we wouldn't have done if we were in an office. So, you know, if you need to step away to answer the door, um, attend to your kids, anything that might come up, please don't worry about it. Go ahead and do it. We understand. <laughs> um, and then lastly, with the chat function, please just refrain from using the chat function uh, when somebody else is presenting because 
they're not going to be able to see what you're saying and it's going to be distracting for the others. Um, for our schedule, um, as you know, we'll be meeting Mondays and Wednesdays, 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern time for this month. And we do have a built in um, five minute or so break that we'll try to hit right around the one hour mark. Um, of course, if you need to step away before then, that's totally fine. Um, for technology norms, um, we'll be using Google Drive for storing the readings and for storing um, the information that you guys upload. Um, so some of the assessments and um, the portfolio that you'll be working on. Obviously, we'll be using Zoom for our synchronous sessions, and you, you all came today successfully. So um, please let us know, though, if you have any issues with access. Um, for tracking progress, we're going to be using um, what is the StarTalk teacher equivalent of Lingofolio. It's called Catalyst. Um, and Demo will be getting into that later of how we use it and how we're going to be working with it. Lastly, um, for communication, please feel free to email us with any questions that you have. Um, if necessary, we can also um, talk on the phone as well, but we want you to know that we're, we're available and we wanna answer your questions. We're really excited about this. Um, yeah, those are, those are the norms. So, Next part, we're done talking about us. We're done talking about expectations. Um, who are you guys? So uh, you guys represent an, an amazing geographic span. Um, we have two programs in Alaska. We've got programs on the West Coast, the Southwest, um, lots of programs in the South, the Northeast, and the Upper Midwest. Um, and of course, this is uh, us here in uh, Michigan. This is the home program. So as you know, we asked you guys to fill out a pre-program survey just to get a sense of who you are, um, where you are at in terms of your comfort level with different aspects that we'll be discussing during this session, um, as well as what kinds of questions you have. And you guys have great questions. Um, so I picked out a few of them uh, so you can kind of see where your peers are. That I, and these are questions that I thought were representative of what others have asked. So you've come to this program because you want to know how can you assess your students' progress in a way that aligns with the proficiency standards? What if you have students in the same class with clearly different levels? Maybe it's because you have a mix of heritage speakers and non-heritage speakers. Um, maybe you have attendance issues in your high school such that some students can only come a handful of days throughout the week. How can you still fairly measure everybody's progress? A number of you brought up the fact that the testing can be really stressful and anxiety inducing. And you wanna know how can you assess your students' language in a way that, that doesn't cause them to get their blood levels raising? And, and finally, a lot of you asked how you can help students track their own progress. So not just you as the teacher assessing where they are, but, but giving students the ability to see for themselves what kind of progress they're making in the language. Um, we also asked you what your goals are for the program, and, and hopefully we'll be able to answer these throughout the course of the next couple of weeks. So many of you wanted to get a sense of what are the different types of assessments that are out there. You know, we asked you about where you get your assessment ideas from, and a lot of you said the textbook, or I just asked what other people are doing in my department. So hopefully you'll get some ideas here that you can um, incorporate into your current assessment routine. Some of you also said you wanna have a firmer and more ready sense of the proficiency guidelines. So most of us can probably name the guidelines and have a general sense of what they mean. Um, but I know that I do not spend a lot of time thinking about my own students' proficiency level and exactly where they are and exactly where I want them to be. And so 
we hope that this program will, will give you some protected space to really reflect on those standard proficiency levels and utilize them for your own classes. Um, a lot of you said you wanted to collaborate with your new colleagues. You said you're really excited to get ideas. You, you read the, the biographies of the other participants and you can't wait to network with them. Um, so, so you guys are also uh, really contributing in large part to this program. Uh, and then lastly, a lot of participants said that, you know, they're, they like the idea of assessments, but they want to do it in a way that is practical, that um, is amenable to different levels of proficiency that they can use throughout the semester, that they can do it in a way that's, that's standardized, but still um, makes sense with the daily um, norms and procedures that come up with your own classroom. Uh, lastly, uh, we asked everybody to give their own definition of proficiency in their target language. Um, and I, I took your answers and I made a word cloud out of them. So a word cloud, for, for those of you who are less familiar with it, um, the, the more times that a word came up in your answers, the bigger the word is on the screen. So I want you guys to just take a moment and, and read through these, try to figure out, you know, which are ones that, that you wrote down or that you agree with? And what are some of them that you're, you're surprised aren't a lot bigger or um, that you're surprised even made it up there at all? All right, so Liz, should I go ahead and start with the next part? Yeah, we're not gonna answer this question right now, but I just wanted to get this in your brain so we can open up the uh, can of proficiency worms, so to speak. Great, mm -hmm. all right, so I'll take over. Can everyone see my screen? It's the same one that Liz just had up. <clears throat> so what we're gonna do over the next half hour is I'm gonna lead you through um, a little bit of Star Talk's plan for acquire. What are the three steps? Many of you who have been in Star Talk before: acquire, process, and apply. Those are the three fundamental um, steps in language acquisition that Star Talk follows. So we're using those those steps in our workshop as well. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about first, for about 10 to 15 minutes before we start our first activity is what is foreign or second language speaking proficiency? How do we test it? How do we make valid assessments that tap into it? <clears throat> and how can our assessments promote it? And this is the big picture question about what we're doing. And it overlaps with some of the questions that you had in the survey that Liz just reviewed. So this is our theory. Foreign or second language speaking ability is a skill that develops through practice. So we feel that it is very akin to like learning how to play the piano and becoming proficient in the piano or something like learning how to play tennis. Of course, in speaking, there are many other skill areas, social dynamics, uh, pragmatics, um, sociocultural competence, all of these things that are also part of foreign language speaking ability. But all of these things happen through practice. We know that. And to practice um, is how you develop the motor skills in the mouth and also how you develop the brain patterning to grab the vocabulary as you need it and to process everything that you need. So proficiency, some of you asked in the survey, you know, how do I measure general proficiency? I hope you never really do because <laughs> we've kind of debunked it. We think of proficiency writ large as kind of a myth. It's a very abstract construct. Proficiency writ large is vast and cover all domains for all ages. But if you want to get at someone's 
proficiency, you have to sample it, you have to observe it, you have to get um, them to perform. You have to have them perform so that you can see how good they are. And this is contextualized, it's relative to their age and their cognitive ability level. And that's why we're bringing in people like Caitlin Cornell to talk about um, differentiated learning accommodations and uh, we're bringing in Megan Driver to talk about heritage language learners uh, because all of them differ in many different ways. So if, if you sample multiple times within a shorter period of time, you can see the depth of their knowledge. The depth of their knowledge is horizontal. And over time, you can see growth, which in our theory is vertical. So you have to define the context to give them an appropriate performance opportunity, make sure they're engaged in it, and then you can get the person to showcase what they can do in the language. The performance will indicate their proficiency, which is abstract and can really only be seen in its, can't be seen in its totality. You sample it, right? You, you go into it and say, let's see you do this task and it will be an indication of your proficiency. Um, so what do we need to do if we're to sample a person's piano ability what information do you need to be able to do that? So I thought I will see if I can see all of you in my gallery view. Can I call on people? Um, Natalia Black, what would you do if I told you you need to sample someone's piano ability? What information would you throw back at me? Well, you mean what kind of assessment? Yeah, uh, you could think of it as what kind of assessment. What kind of assessment would you do? I would, I would, uh, I would ask, uh, what, uh, what is your favorite piece, and uh, would you like to perform it? That's hmm. what if it's about piano. Okay, yeah, so I would, you're thinking I would like about this. the domain of the task. Like you would ask the 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 testee, what is it that you can show me? Great, Angelina Rubina. Do you have other questions that you would ask to sample a person's piano ability? What information do you need? Well, it's actually about their ability to play different types of uh, like plays. I mean, I, I went to a music school and I know, so you, you, you can play like classical uh, things and you also play like, in Russian it's called it too, the, I don't know the word for that in, uh, in English, just like a, it's technical stuff that you have to perform. Okay, so that so. could be, you're, you're asking about the domains. Uh, what areas of proficiency are you going to tap into? Mariah Converse, what else are you thinking of that you need? Um, I, I want to know what, what sort of approximately what level is the student at? Are they a beginner, intermediate? Do they read music or do they, um, or do they play by ear? Right. Um, so you're starting to get at the kid or the person. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe um, you also need more information about that. How would you get that? So to get a general idea of their ability, would you ask like, how many years have you been taking piano? Maybe, but that can be deceptive. I took 12 years of piano and I'm still pretty terrible. Mm. So, <laughs> so um, maybe how long and the intensity of the program that they were in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, and Olga Starchenko, anything else you need to know? Um, I think maybe a level music or technical and many um, uh, years, how many years. Right. So let's say I tell all of you that it's a 45 year old man who's going to walk in and be tested. Or I tell you it's a nine year old child, a girl. Does that change how you would assess them? Is that uh, you're shaking your head, <laughs> Savenkova? What do you think? <laughs> no, unfortunately, I didn't go to a music school, but I think like their age doesn't mean anything for ours, uh, for our instructions. Yeah. So you can be like, 
45, 60, but you're still beginner in playing piano. So yeah, I, I agree with Mariah. I would uh, collect some information and would probably ask uh, some questions about their background. But at the same time, it would be just a starting point for maybe a piece of um, art I would give them, suggest to play. And after that, it's just a starting point, yeah. Great. How about tennis? To sample a person's tennis ability, what information do you need? Sama? Um, pretty similar, probably. I need to know, uh, like, how 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 many how many days uh, do they use in the week to practice, and how many hours uh, mm -hmm. they practice? Um, is it something they? Is it something like a hobby they really want to do it, and they want to like really be successful with that? Right. Um, how interested they are in this. Uh, sport and the tennis. So yeah, something just like that. That's right. So I think a lot of what we're doing is we're calibrating even before we create the assessment, we're getting other information to kind of get a guess at their ability level and what context they can be assessed in. And this is trying to prove a point. I'm trying to prove a point that there's no such thing as a general proficiency test. It would you can't do it. You have to create assessments that are targeted to the students who are going to take the test that are aligned with their interests. And yeah, maybe even ask them what they want to be tested on. It should be fair. It should be something that they've practiced and it should be, um, you know, something that they'll be challenged with. So this weekend, I spent a lot of time at the state tennis tournament. My daughter is on the high school varsity tennis team. And she went uh, and was very excited. And she played uh, with another team. She was in the doubles. And they lost the first match, 6-4. And then they won the second one. It was very close, 5-7. You have to win by two. And usually it's two out of three um, is the winner. So they went to a third match, which was tied. And then, then they had a tiebreaker. So their match went on for three and a half hours. She was exhausted but she was excited. She said, wow, that tennis was my ability level. I was able to show what I can do. And she said, if a coach had come and watched her, she would have felt really proud because she was doing her best tennis. Meanwhile, she had a friend on the team uh, who played a first group and they, they just beat them. They were um, a lower ranked school and her friend handily won 6-0, 6-0. And then she was in her second round of play because she did win. She advanced to another team and that team just clobbered her 0-6, So she went from a really easy game to a super difficult game where she didn't have a chance. And my daughter said that was too bad because she didn't get to show what she could do. She didn't get to play well at state. So my daughter, even though she lost, she felt that she was able to do her best. Um, and that's what you want to do with an assessment. It should be matched to their ability level and it should help them do their best and showcase their best. So to sample a person's speaking ability, you need all of that type of information. You get these proxies for their ability level already, and then you create assessments that will demonstrate their performance as an indicator of their proficiency, which you already kind of have a guess at. So in that sense, the, the tests that you create should allow them to practice, should allow them to show their best. So we use a lot of different scales. Hmm, my screen is a little blurry. What is going on? Mm -hmm. I think it's just slow loading. Um, some of the scales that we're used to are the actual proficiency scales. When we um, surveyed all of you, you said that you uh, are familiar with the actual proficiency scale from novice low to um, advanced. And in the USA, we divide foreign or second language learning primarily in terms of segments that correspond with foreign and second language learning opportunities. So we have some pretty good descriptions of, of what typical learning looks like in various contexts. So here with us today, we have people junior high from like 11, 12, up through high school, college, and we don't, we're not focusing on working life here. 
So the ACTL guidelines are probably the most important uh, appropriate scale for us to use for measuring proficiency, but there are many others. So I wanted to just talk to you about the history of these scales for measuring proficiency. So I also do a lot of work with the Foreign Service Institute. I'm on a panel that's helping them revise the tests that they use for American diplomats and foreign service personnel. So they have a school of language studies and it provides language and culture training to US government employees with job related needs. And it addresses all aspects of language training. So we kind of know where we are when we're testing uh, adults. So where we are is we're, we're talking about the working life. So they start when they're 23 and most of these students are being tested between the age of 23 and 55. And the scale that they use, it's called the ILR scale of, of zero to five. It's for the interagency language roundtable. It's all of the government um, offices, the FBI, the CIA, the military branches and the Foreign Service Institute. And their goal is to get people to three, the general profes professional proficiency so that they can get a job abroad. And um, the scale was designed for them. And it's with the US government, it's clear how old the person is and when and where they've been learning the language and for what purpose it's to work abroad or to work professionally in a government position using the language. So this scale was made first in the 1950s um, for the purposes of the government proficiency. And it is for this working life part of our lives. And it's very contextual to the United States. So they started in the 1960s and 70s to apply it to college students to define their proficiency. And it didn't work very well because college students are not doing the same types of tasks as, for, as uh, foreign service officers and military personnel. So ACTFL was born. It was actually um, born for the college level to describe college level language learning. And you can see that novice roughly corresponds to the first year if you start learning Arabic or Russian in college, second, third, and hopefully fourth. Um, but these were also made with German, French, and Spanish in mind more than Russian or Arabic. So this pace of learning is tied to Spanish, French, and German. And something that's interesting too is a lot of students um, take those languages in high school. So you can very quickly move through novice up to intermediate at the college level. So the ACTFL scale is really designed for the college years. And we also had at the same time in the 1990s, the beginning of the Common European Framework of References for Languages. So maybe some of you have heard of that. It's another scale for adults. Uh, it's for um, you know, uh, language exchange and working conditions in Europe. And it's the A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2 scale. Um, so this one too is more for adults and not tied to college level learning, but more just learning foreign languages in general. So now we have these three different scales. So you might be wondering, which one do we use? <laughs> um, we tend to use the ACTFL scale mainly because we're in the United States. Um, both the ACTFL scale and the Sefer scale have been pulled down to apply to the high school level. So several of you are teaching high school and a couple of you are teaching middle school. I must say these scales don't do as good of a job. The pace of learning in uh, junior high and high school does not match the pace of learning at high school or college. Uh, and the development that's expected is not mapped directly onto what you would expect in the college years. So while we have pulled down those scales and tried to apply them to the lower levels, it doesn't always work as well as we would hope. So there are crosswalks where you can see how these scales are aligned. And um, it's funny to me that they, they've aligned it with the ILR, the Interagency Language Roundtable, which is really for adults 20 out of college and above for working level proficiency. So obviously in high school, we're not trying to get people to working professional level proficiency, but we, we call that superior or 10 on the ACTFL scale, same as C2 on the Sefer scale. Um, and there are these crosswalks assuming that they are similar scales, but they're not. They were designed for different purposes, for different contexts, for different people, um, and with different languages in mind. 
So, oops, I'm sorry, my screen is just a little slow. So we have these different scales, the 1950s Foreign Service Institute ILR scale, 1980s brought us ACTFL, 1990s in Europe, um, we've got the Council of Europe Framework of References for Languages, but we also have more. There's the Canadian language benchmarks for adults learning French or English in um, Canada. China now has the Chinese standards of English language ability for preschool to young adult to map onto their English programs uh, K through 16. And we even have another scale here in the United States, if any of you are familiar with English language teachers in your public schools, uh, they're using the WIDA standards, a scale of one to six for children learning English in the United States. So when people tell you, are you measuring proficiency, are you measuring growth, you have to tie it to one of these scales for the to be able to use the common language. Oh, my students are intermediate mid. Uh, means something, and we can use it as a common lingua franca, but um, also with a grain of salt, especially for the younger ages. So scales of proficiency are heavily influenced by the instructional, temporal, geographic, demographic, and cultural context within, uh, within which they are developed. And also modern scales have to have crosswalks to teachers. And this is usually done through sample tasks described in the standards, textbooks, or lists of can-do statements or workshops, right? So this work entails the basic procedure of aligning classroom or assessment tasks with the functional scale descriptions of what a learner can do at the various levels of proficiency. So we have the general area of novice, our students who can communicate with formulaic and wrote utterances, lists, and phrases. And then we can break these down into more concrete can-do lists, like my students can list all of the people in their family, and my students can talk about their normal day, right? Um, so what we want to do is decide whether we want to measure vertical growth, um, maybe in a program that has two or more years of instruction, where we would have during the first year tasks align with the novice level and then in the second year tasks align with the Im intermediate level and that way we can see evidence of this no um, growth uh, that is vertical but within any given year let's say it's a, a second or third year where we are focusing on intermediate level tasks to show growth we won't be able to show it on the vertical axis. Rather, we will show depth in a variety of different tasks that can be completed at the intermediate level. So you can think about whether you want to measure vertical growth or horizontal growth or a mix of both. Another area of uh, language proficiency that's difficult to apply to junior high, speaking to the junior high people in particular, is the ACTFL scale has been broken into two sections, that at the bottom level, it's more basic interpersonal communication skills, so for core language proficiency. Um, and at the higher level, it's cognitive or academic language proficiency, a higher order cognition. So what might happen is with children or um, people in junior high, is you might stay at the um, basic interpersonal communication skills area. So don't expect growth to be all the way up the scale uh, to the advanced level in junior high or high school, or even in the beginnings of Arabic or Russian programs. Rather, um, work for depth, because we know that we need a lot of depth. The actual scale seems to indicate that there's not as much time spent at the lower level. But that's because usually in the college level, students move very quickly to the upper level, but it doesn't have to be that way in all language programs. So maybe in college programs, teachers spend little time teaching the BICs and more time teaching the CALPs, but that doesn't need, we mean we always need to. And proficiency scales measure vertical and not lateral growth. And children experience rich lateral growth, especially in the BICs, and especially at the middle school and early high school levels. So I guess my question for you is, when you're thinking of your testing for this upcoming academic year, do you want to measure vertical growth or horizontal growth or both? And 
the other question I have is, have you mapped the tasks that you teach in your class to the Axel scale? So you have concrete curriculum. And the question is, can you look through your textbook or the materials that you have and identify the tasks for what level of proficiency they're at? And then if you do see that your whole semester is more at the intermediate, mid, intermediate, high range, you may decide that you want to measure more of the horizontal growth within that proficiency bandwidth rather than trying to measure vertical growth. All right, so I'm gonna have you try to apply some of this. Um, so what I wanna do now is all of you got a binder in the mail, correct? So if you could grab your binder, I wanna go over the production goals on the MSU StarTalk clap schedule an information sheet in your binder. So this is this overview sheet um, that you should have. And you can, oops, sorry, my uh, computer blocks it out with my virtual background. And it's in the um, StarTalk folder on your first part. And it has a section in the middle that's called uh, production goals, which are broken into three different chunks. Um, so these are the production goals that StarTalk we'll call the pieces of evidence of applying learning and applying uh, the various components of the StarTalk CLAP workshop. So something that we're going to do today is that first checkbox under the June 2021 synchronous online summer session schedule. We're going to compose a portfolio cover sheet, and I'm going to give you the directions now. The other things that we're going to do during this June workshop is we're going to have you draft a group oral assessment and a rubric for doing group orals with your students in your classes. We're also gonna, we're gonna give you examples first and then ask you to design one. Then you're gonna draft a multimodal presentational speaking assessment in two rubrics, one for the teacher and one for peer reviewing. And then we're also gonna have you draft a can-do self-assessment and we'll give you an example one first and then have you develop one for your specific class that you'll be teaching in fall 2021. So these components make up the um, StarTalk CLAP portfolio of assessments um, that we have. And then in the fall, we have walk-in virtual office hour sessions, and these are optional, but we hope you will participate. And we're going to ask you to pilot your three assessments in the rubrics with your fall 2021 classes, one class. Um, it's up to you. And then you can visit with me in the Friday virtual office hours to go over any administration issues or questions that you have as you apply what you've learned. And then what we um, hope you will do, oops, I'm going to change that. We're not going to upload it to D2L. We're going to use the Google folder that Liz uh, Huntley set up. And we're going to ask you to upload uh, your test score data with no student information, just the scores, no names. Uh, for a January, February consultation on the test reliability. And we'll crunch those numbers for you to get you those numbers to give you um, item statistics and things like that. And then uh, we'll ask you to put all of your things together into this portfolio that's in Google Drive. And then in uh, January or February, we'll ask you to write a reflection sheet, which will be parallel to what we're doing today with our cover sheet but the reflection sheet will be at the end where you talk about um, how it worked, creating the materials and then using them in your class. And also you can do a session with me and Dima, we will be um, uh, analyzing your fall test score data and give you information on what you could potentially change in your tests to make them more reliable from a statistic standpoint. Um, and that's optional as well. And then we will have a post-workshop survey and we'd also work with you to upload your, um, your tests if you'd like to in a public repository of materials sharing on the Modern Language Association uh, syllabus and test material sharing database. And so we'll show you where that is and walk you through it. Okay, any questions so far about those big production goals? You can go ahead and talk if you have a question. So far, so good. All right, I will also be available after the session today and also over email or um, in a session on Friday if you would like to come to virtual office hours. 
Um, so what I'd like you to do now is go to the profic proficiency portfolio cover sheet that we've made for you. So Liz, I was going to ask if you could put in the chat the um, link to the proficiency portfolio cover sheets, I guess maybe just to that bigger folder, and then I'll go to it too to show them where. With, she's just going to give you a the chat now. Um, that'll take you guys to um, all of the participant materials that you'll be accessing over the course of um, the Star Talk program. Great. Oh, there it is. Yes. So you'll be going to the portfolio folder. Uh, the link is now also in the chat. And did you find yours? Raise your hand when you have found your portfolio cover sheet in your folder. I'll wait till everyone has their hand raised. Mm -hmm. okay. Or you could put up a virtual thumbs up or something if you do not have your cam camera on and that is fine. Mm -hmm. I think, okay. Great, Svetlana Nuss found it. Okay. So in this cover sheet, um, there are three different sections. And what we're gonna ask you to do is to um, finish this cover sheet by the end of this Wednesday session. So it's kind of homework for tonight, but we're gonna get started with it now. It has three different sections. One is you as a teacher, and it's just a paragraph that you write about you as a teacher. And then um, a paragraph about your students and then your unit's proficiency targets. And by unit, we mean the class that you'll be teaching in fall 2021. If you're teaching more than one, you can pick one to focus on, or you can talk about all three of them. So I'd like to put you in six different breakout rooms. And we'll do this by um, creating six rooms that you will volunteer to join. So it's uh, the third option, Liz, in the breakout room choices. Um, I'm wondering if you could do that, because uh, I think I can't make, do the breakout rooms myself right now. Is that right? I can do them right now. Okay. So what I want you to do is find your name on this sheet, uh, so you know which um, group to go into. And there's, um, what I would like you to do is take about, mm, I think about eight minutes, maybe nine minutes nine minutes to talk about the three different sections in your group. So I've broken you into um, Arabic college teachers. There's two groups of you. Russian college teachers, there's two groups of you. And then Arabic younger and Russian younger. So that's high school or middle school so that you can meet people who are teaching at the same level as you approximately. And then um, talk about how you will respond to these questions. What I'll do is in the... Um, Every three minutes, I'll ask you to move on to the next question if you can, but we'll have about nine minutes total for doing that. So did you, everyone find their name and you know which room you will volunteer to go to when Liz uh, drives the uh, rooms? Great. Mm -hmm. So what you should do is scroll down to the bottom of the box that just popped up in your menu and you'll be able to join the group that you belong to by clicking join. And don't worry if you get lost, you can, you can unjoin and go back. So let me know if you have any questions. As you join, you'll be leaving. <laughs> so I'm if you have about, questions. I, I, I couldn't find the cover sheet. Where exactly is that? Oh, Islam, the cover yeah. sheet will be in your folder. Um, there'll be a folder at that link. There are so many folders there. So which one? The club resources or club teacher participation or club workshop slides? So um, within that folder, yeah, I, I sent the, the folder that contains everything that you guys will be using for this um, Star Talk program. You're going to navigate to the one called um, participant portfolios. I cannot find it either. <laughs> so okay. I, I, let me let me um I started the one in the beginning, but it's uh, scheduling information and that's there are only three folders. Uh, uh, Liz, there's only four folders. Club guest lecture, club resources, club teacher participation, and club workshop slides. Uh, Paul, are you are you 
You're showing your screen right now. I'm sharing my screen. Yeah, let me go in and um, see if I can find that. I can still see my screen. So it's in teaching materials. Or it's in CLAP curriculum, right? right? My screen is very Should be small. one folder titled CLAP Teacher Participant Portfolios within, okay. within that broad folder. Okay, I found this one, CLAP Teacher Participant, Participant Portfolio. So. Right, and then within that, there should be 20 subfolders um, organized by last name, first name, and then a three-letter code indicating Arabic or Russian. Okay, I found it, yeah. So. Okay, I found it. Thank you. Okay, good. No, no, no problem. I mean, we're... can you tell me where you found it? Because I cannot find mine. Yeah. Not a problem at all. Um, <laughs> so click on the link that I sent in the chat. Okay, I did already. And then you, you should see four folders and one file when you click on that link. Oh, okay. Um, one, of, one of the folders is titled CLAP Teacher Participant Portfolios. Okay. I found it now. Excellent. Okay. Was there's, a, there's a lot of layers here, so thanks for sticking with us. Yeah, and Slitlana, you to Kova, you will go to room six. Yeah. And uh, Olga Starchenko, did you find your folder? Okay. And Mona, you did too? And slit oh, I just found it correct. Oh, good. So I'm in uh, room what? Um, You'll be uh, in room room one, Arabic College one. Do you want me to move you there? I can move her to Arabic College one. Oh, she did it. Mm -hmm. And Olga, you move to room six. Which is Russian younger. Lana Mus in Russian College Two. Okay, you have to join Slitlana. There she did. And Olga. Good, they did it. Yay! <laughs> yes, it worked. So do, 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 do you want us to move around the rooms or give them a no. little bit of time to talk? Let's take a break. Let's <laughs> let them do it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. And I'll make, I have a homework slide. So I'll um, mention the uh, cover sheet again, at the very end. So far so good, right? Yeah, no, it's great. I was gonna say, do we do we want to give them a break at a certain point since we're already at um, seven o five? Yeah. So when they come back at seven o nine, I will give them a five minute break. Perfect. So then we'll start promptly at seven fifteen with Dima. That went so fast. <laughs> it really did. It took them a long time to do the um, the the consent form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this yeah. too. Hmm. A little confusing, but good. Yeah, and then I, yeah. <laughs> um, another thing, well, we can just ask if they have questions. Um, but Paula, I don't think you define BICs and CALPs. Oh. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> but I, there may be a question about that, so. There might be. Should I? I don't know, broadcast a question to all the rooms asking them like. Oh, let me do it. that. Let me say. Um, that if they have any questions about what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, I'll put something talk. Um, if you would please um, move on to talking about you as a teacher or move more importantly to question three, which is where you describe your classes. And you can tell them that 
some of the answers from their survey have already been put into, or I can, I can do that to them. You want me to broadcast that? Uh, I'm, I think I got it. Okay. Interestingly, I don't see your, your message. Okay, you'll see in a second. Broadcast message to all? Is there a thing? In breakout rooms, there is a broadcast message to all. Yeah, oh, I just oh, did yeah. it. Oh, okay. But I think you have to be in a group to see it. Mm -hmm. No, I, I see it now, though. You must have just I, I can. It. I see oh, the blue. Do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we are at seven minutes, so we are almost about to do the break. Yeah. I didn't have time to go over the, um, they really will have to do it as homework because they're supposed to go through the actual guidelines and then the. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Dima, how, how much time were you gonna take the second hour? I'm very flexible, but uh, my plan is 45 minutes. So we're gonna finish at eight. Okay. But I can. Yeah, why not go ahead yeah. and do it. Yeah, go ahead and Dima and do as you were planning. Cause then, um, this might bleed into Wednesday. You know, we'll take some time to, to recuperate and maybe tomorrow afternoon, if you guys have time to meet up, we could talk mm -hmm. about the, the second hour of- Of the second day. Wednesday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna broadcast a message. Um, one more minute and we are done. Are you drinking tea? Of course. Of course. I mean, it's a Russian tea hour. Yeah, it's a big thing. <laughs> Ongoing. <laughs> Russian tea, 24 hours? Exactly. Okay. Hi, Islam. Hi, Alet. Welcome back. Hello, Simon. Islam and Allah, what do you think so far? This is really exciting. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. The breakout rooms will close in 20 seconds, so then we'll all be back. Isa, Svetlana, Angelina, welcome back, Angelina. Okay, they got five <laughs> seconds left and they'll all pour back in. <laughs> Recording. In all right, everyone's back. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome back. So that was to give you a teaser, a little preview of the homework assignment for Wednesday. So I noticed you know, that you've got two components that are external to the worksheet that you'll have to look at. And those are the actual proficiency guidelines and also the actual can-do statements, right? Does anyone have any questions about accessing or using those documents? Okay. Let me know if you do. Because what we want you to do, um, hopefully before we start on Wednesday, is to answer those three questions. Um, and the third question is the largest one with two parts, identifying the level on the actual scale of the class that you will teach in fall 2021, and then um, actually writing out can-do statements that are mapped to your curriculum. And so looking at the can-do statements in the uh, document that we provided you a link to, you'll find that those statements are bit broad. So you'll actually want to look at real um, can-do areas, uh, things that your students can do by the end of your fall 2021 class, and map those in and put those in the worksheet. 
So all you need to do is do this in Google Docs. Um, you can let it live there. Uh, and then on at the end of class on Wednesday, uh, Dimitri will show you how to upload it to the StarTalk Catalyst system, and he'll give more information about that. So what we're going to do now is have a five-minute break. Um, so come back in, uh, let's see, not that one, return, <laughs> and I'll put the time in there. Come back at 7.15, I guess 7.16 then, is that all right? Uh, take a five-minute break. Mm -hmm. Um, I just have a question. Do we have access to this presentation? Yes. Where mm -hmm. I'm looking at the, is it under resources? It's in slides. Or, um, Liz, what is the name of the Oh, folder? under slides? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yes, our goal is to have all of the PowerPoints uploaded before uh, the day of the presentation, and then they're there for you to use. Okay. All right. Thank you. have access to the recording as well afterwards. Okay, thank you so much. While we're waiting for everybody to get back, do you, do you guys have any questions so far about um, the portfolio cover sheet? One question I have, um, so I teach four levels of Arabic, and I'm just wondering if there's any advice as to how I should choose which class or classes I focus on in this program. Could you, Katie, maybe pick, because Star Talk would like um, evidence that the assessments that you created worked. So you can create the assessments for all four classes, you know, if you wanted to make four sets. But maybe for the purposes of the Star Talk CLAP evidence that they ask you to upload at the end, and that would be the, um, the production goals that we have, maybe pick one class to focus on for the assignments and for, um, so what levels are you teaching, Katie? One through four. And those correspond with like first year, second year, third yes. year, and fourth year. So maybe you wanna focus either on first year or second year, I'm not sure if, um, or gosh, it's really up to you. Like which course would you want to primarily make assessments for? And then you can, you know, uh, duplicate them at the different levels at the others, but maybe just pick one that will be the focus of the StarTalk um, class. And then the, the uploading of the materials would be at that one targeted level. Okay. Yeah, Thank it is you. up to you which one. But yeah, we can, we can help you with, you know, if you say I'm designing this group oral for level two, which I'll upload to um, StarTalk for evidence, but I'm also going to do class one, two, and three, or one, two, and four, um, we can help you with those, and we're happy to do it, but you won't have to upload the others. Okay, great. Thank Does that you. sound good, Dima and Liz? I was going to say, maybe just from a practical perspective, um, it could make sense to, I, I presume first year is your largest class and it levels off after that. It, it not always, it sort of depends. Okay. And I do, I have one level where I have two sections. Sorry. I don't want to like take over time with these very individual questions. <laughs> um, as well. So I don't know if it makes sense to do a class where I have two sections of the same level or not two, or if it really doesn't matter. It's okay for us. You can choose, you know, one of some of the things we're going to talk about too, are do you have heritage students in one class, but not the other? Because of course, heritage students um, have very different learning trajectories. So I always kind of feel that um, our Hindi teachers in particular and Turkish teachers, Russian um, and Arabic at MSU are sometimes they're teaching two classes at the same time. So mm -hmm. your assessments may uh, have maybe a different rubric or a different feedback focus depending on who the student is. Um, so I think you'll have more than enough to, to work with no matter which course you choose. Um, and you can customize it. If you say I'm working with these four groups, you can describe all four if you wanna do that. Okay, thank you so much. Dima, go ahead. I'm gonna mute my microphone.
Oh, thank you, Paula. And uh, I just want to clarify, because we also have uh, speakers of Arabic here, you can call me Dima. It's a friendly Russian nickname. Russians have nicknames like Alexander, Sasha, Dmitry, Dima. So Dmitry or Dima, it's fine. I know it's a female name in Arabic, but that's okay. So uh, in my part of the presentation, we will talk about tasks and rubrics. And um, I'll show you some examples. And we're going we're gonna to acquire, process, and apply. So that's the new... PPP, present process, produce, if I remember correctly, but this time it's acquire process and apply. We're going to think about what makes a good rubric, and then you will try tasks and rubrics. So we'll have raters and we'll have students, but we're going to do English this time, not, uh, not Arabic or Russian. So let's start with the acquire part. And um, I'm going to, in line with test-based language teaching, I'm going to give you a pre-task. So I'm going to show you some rubrics and some tasks. Now I want you to think, what are some differences between the tasks and the rubrics? And a, a spoiler uh, alert for you, the tasks, the rubrics will be drastically different. Um, and think about which task or rubric would work best for your students or for different students, right? And I also just want to um, clarify. So this is the, um, our learning management system, Google Drive. We're not going to be using D2L. So here you can find the slides. Your portfolios are here and resources are here and the lecture readings are here. So if you go to the resources week one, and I hope you can see it all, you can see your first resources. So the two rubrics and the tasks. So let's start with the tasks. And by the way, let me just, you can follow my screen if you want, or I can actually send you the link in the chat. Um, just give me a second. Uh, sent to everyone. Did everyone get it? Okay. Or you can also follow my screen if you want. Um, so let's start with the um, uh, group tasks. So all of them uh, are fun, first of all, and all of them are consensus tasks. And so let you have consensus task here, consensus task about movies, about restaurants, and about packing for an island vacation. So, um, yeah, I think that's all. I, I don't know about you, but that's what I need right now, uh, an island vacation. So the purpose of this task, so what you do, you have a rater or two raters, and you have students, at least two in a group or you can do maybe five or four, depending on your purposes. And what the students need to do, they need to interact and they need to come up to a consensus. So that's why it's called a consensus task. And in this uh, task, the consensus is the number of items and the items that they need to take on a vacation, to an island vacation. So you have 12 items here and they need to pick up five. So it's... Um, Maybe they want some rope, maybe they want beer, maybe they just want beer, I don't know. So, but that's a consensus task. So there, there is another one. So it's also consensus task. This time, um, I think it's a little bit more realistic. So in this test, they choose a movie to watch. So they have a movie night, um, they have different people, different tastes, and they need to pick up a movie to watch. So this is one you can integrate um, different materials, authentic materials. So we have Titanic, Harry Potter, Superman. So picking a movie to watch, basically. Something that we do in real life, right? And there is another one. So we are in East Lansing, Michigan. Well, listen, it's in Ann Arbor, but we're in East Lansing, Michigan. So we have some restaurants, similar idea, but they need to pick up a restaurant to go. So the students discuss the restaurants, different options. Maybe they're vegetarian. Maybe they want a family-friendly restaurant. So, um, and they pick up one of the restaurants, maybe Pizza House, Outback. And they need to come up, uh, they, need, they need a consensus. They need to reach this consensus and choose a restaurant. But again, that's not the most important thing. So th this outcome is good. It's measurable. It's, you can see it, but the process is more important. Um, so these are the tasks. And by the way, if you want to like interrupt me, that's fine. If you have any questions, raise your hand or like Russians interrupt each other all the time. This is how we communicate. So please, I'll, I'll be fine. So uh, here's the tasks, okay? So um, consensus tasks often used in research and in um, language testing. So let's take a look at the rubrics. So um, uh, 
Uh, let's start with this one. Can you see it? Can you see it better, a little bit better? Okay, so what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you see this rubric? So we have pronunciation, fluency, accuracy, grammar, vocabulary, content, communicative skills, and strategies. So what is, I don't, do you have any associations? I don't know. Have you seen it, this type of rubric before? Luke, yeah, go ahead. Honestly, the first thing I think is it's gonna take me way too long to grade and I'm going to get impatient with, with that process and be mad at myself for making it. <laughs> that's exactly, that's good, that's great. That's, a, that's a, it's, it's the first thing that I can think of too. Also, I think about IELTS and TOEFL. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the standardized English test, but that's uh, international students. We had to deal with this kind of stuff. Any other thoughts? Thank you, Luke, by the way. Any other thoughts, suggestions, comments? Yeah, it's not student friendly. It's, it's uh, many words, but I, I would throw a lot more graphics and it's something that's a lot easier to read for, not, not reader friendly. Not reader friendly. We need graphics. I infographics. StarTalk also likes infographics. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to show you some of those. Um, okay, very good. Let me make it a little bit smaller. Okay. And now let's take a look at another rubric. Um, rubric number two. Okay. So, and here you can see it's a little bit different. So it doesn't focus on language uh, skills necessarily. It has two sections, interaction and speech and listening. Okay. And you have multiple students in the group and you rate it from zero to nine, or you can put NA, non-applicable, right? And uh, you can see, so it's a little bit different. So um, take a look. What do you see here? And what do you think about this rubric? Make it bigger. Can, can you see it now? Easier? That's good. Or you can also access the, you can follow my slides or you can uh, go to Google Drive, maybe easier for you. I don't know. I think uh, what they're missing here, grammar and pronunciation, which is not very important for communication and understanding. I, so grammar, we need more grammar in Russian. No, no, I don't, I don't say we need grammar. So the, the main point is to understand and speak. So mm -hmm. and grammar for communication is not as important. I mean, I don't say it's not important at all. Yeah, but the, the, yeah. but the focus is on the communication. Exactly. So maybe should we modify it? I mean, it depends. Maybe you want your students to use complex uh, syntactic structures. I don't know. Maybe you want them to use, for example, future tense. If the task requires to use future tense, maybe you can throw in some grammar stuff here. Uh, in terms of pronunciation, so in this rubric, you can see there's comprehensibility. So it's another term within pronunciation. Um, so is it comprehensible? And you can see there are some interesting things. For example, there's uh, the student was able to recognize communication break, breakdowns. So if, if I say something like, um, students are ubiquitous in East Lansing, right? And you don't know the meaning of the word ubiquitous and you ask, what does it mean? And it's like, it means students are everywhere in East Lansing, right? So it's a communication uh, breakdown and you can also resolve it. So this rubric takes it into account. Um, any other thoughts? So usually with the group oral, we assume that they're, they have not practiced. So this is a task um, like the ones Dima sh showed you yeah. where um, they are choosing which items to take uh, to a deserted island, right? Okay. So it's, it's a task that's supposed to be done in class and you would have, um, or in breakout rooms in Zoom, and you would enter the Zoom room or you would uh, walk to those students and they would be assessed on this rubric. Okay. So the idea is you give them the rubric ahead of time so that they know what they're being assessed on. And you'll see that the two rubrics are very different as uh, Dimitri is showing. Um, one of them promotes, uh, is more of a proficiency oriented where you're, uh, which is very much like the IELTS scale, 
but or the TOEFL scale, but this one, the group oral exam score sheet is has a different value system. It's asking students to contribute to the development of the interaction. You know, these are things that they, the specific vocabulary that they're using um, is not being measured, but more their, their social behavior and actions in the group. Uh, and it encourages practice. So remember that we're always telling them to practice because practice is learning. The next um, assessment that we'll be focusing on uh, in this June workshop is the presentational speaking assessment, which is rehearsed. And then it's a little bit more formalized, but this one's on the spot. So when you're doing um, group orals in class, maybe if you have 25 students, you have five different groups, but on Monday you tell them, I'm, I'm going to assess group A. And the others just practice, but you actually do the assessment. When you have a different group oral uh, the next day and you assess a different group. So in a five day cycle, if you had five different group orals, each, everyone practices all five, but there's one hot group every day that actually gets assessed on the rubric. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, and also, thank you, Paula, and thank you, Mona, for the question. Also, test familiarity plays a role. So the more you do it, the, I don't know, not necessarily better, but having some test familiarity is always good. Okay, so you saw the rubrics and you saw the tasks. So uh, let's do some processing. Um, so, and again, this is not like very formal. So a better task for you, a better rubric. Um, so uh, let's vote first and then discuss. And you can use the function in Zoom to um, raise your hand or clap. I don't know like how it works, but um, so who thinks, um, so, the, and let me just remind you, let's start with the rubric. So, so who thinks this is a better rubric? Anybody? It's a better rubric if you have to grade papers, <laughs> term papers. Okay. Very Inter detailed. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, sure, sure. Okay, what about this one? Who thinks it's a better rubric than the first one? Yeah, every, every, that's good. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I, I, I appreciate it because I, I created this rubric like yesterday. So uh, thank you, appreciate it. And of course you can adapt it for your purposes dependent on your students on everything. Like Paula said, right? You need to, you, you, you need to ask these questions like, what what is it for? What is this rubric for? Maybe if you wanna, if you're doing like formal, very formal oral assessment, maybe this is what you what you probably need. What about tasks? So, um, who thinks that island vacation? So we have island vacation, we have movie night, and we have interview. So who thinks this one is a better task? Inter um, island vacation. Who likes it more? Who thinks it's the best task ever? I mean, it's nice to think about island vacations. Mm -hmm. You are you are absolutely right about that. But yeah, if you think about functionally what we've taught our students, um, this does not feel like something they'll have a lot of vocabulary or context for. Not kind of like real world stuff, right? And what about this one, movie night? Who thinks it's a better one? I like that one, yeah. Like that one? Okay, that's good. It, does it depend some on what the level of your students are and and I mean, like this one seems to have a, it has a different, it has a different set of vocabulary and a different set of um, comprehension skills and analytical skills than the first one or the third one. And maybe they don't know the movies too. I mean, I don't know some, I don't know what, do my students like my Russian students who are like 18 years old, do they know Titanic? I don't know, something like this, maybe not. Yeah, and uh, maybe for more advanced learners, right? Like you said, what about the restaurant task? Who who really likes it? Who likes the yeah, restaurant I like task? that one a lot. Food is okay. universal. It is universal? Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts, opinions? Strong opinions are welcome too, so. Um, I like it okay because you use food vocabulary often, but um, I think the fact that it, it doesn't 
happen in real life is taking me back. So the fact that the students are not going to go out to dinner together means that they're not going to be as invested in the conversation. It's all theoretical. So it feels like it's just practice rather than a task for them to really do something. Um, And so I kind of liked the desert island one better because that's theoretical anyway. Whereas with the restaurant, it, I want students to be invested in it. And I think if they are not, it's not a real conversation, then they're like, okay, sure. We can go to Outback. That's fine. Okay. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you for your suggestions. Yeah. It all depends on your students. Any other um, opinions, comments, concerns? Maybe. Oh, sorry. (laughs) I was just going to say the restaurant one gives them all of their information. Unlike the, the movie one that depends on them already knowing something about those movies. Definitely. So there is some gap. Maybe some someone knows like one movie, but the other, I don't know. Yeah, that's a great point. Anything else? I actually like them all, all. All three of them. I think they have. They each have its place and and time and and certain breadth of vocabulary and and depth of uh, language structures. So I. I think I could use each one of them at different places in my class. Awesome. And you have it. So it's in the folder uh, resources so you can use it. (laughs) And you can, you know, I was thinking maybe modify, like change the movies. If it's a Russian class, I would pick up something like Russian movies on Netflix, like To the Lake or like The The Lost Tsar. What was the name of it? Maybe pick it, put it there. I don't know. Paula? Dmitry, you can actually suggest students to pick the movie. So each of students can pick a movie and after that they can uh, make the task more real. They can modify it by themselves. And it relates to the first task as well about the island. You can just say like you can't bring a cell phone. So what can you do? You can't post photos on Instagram. You can't interact with your uh, like uh, close friends. So what should you need to entertain yourself and others on the island when you're isolated from like social media that's great that's wonderful that's wonderful thank you isa 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 is all them whatever okay. um yeah thank you that's wonderful start keep thinking about it because you will have your own task you will develop your own task with your own rubrics that you will use with your students in the fall okay but let's practice let's imagine it's an english class i know it's not perfect but Okay, so you have the resource, everyone has the rubrics, everyone has the um, tasks. What do I want to do? Okay, this one. Mm, so let's, I'm going to break you, no, like break you. I'm going to divide you into break breakout sessions. Sorry, my English, it's, it's been a long day. Anyway, so um, it's going to, I'm going to divide into groups and each group will have a rater. Okay, one rater and sorry in advance, and but you can, there's some freedom for you. You can choose any rubric that do you want to choose the, the big one with the pronunciation or the, the second one, the task key rubric. So pick one rubric and work in your groups. I'm going to do it right away. And I want you to complete a packing for an island vacation task in English. So let's think that we are going on a vacation and each group will have a rater. You know, choose the rubric that you prefer. So is it clear? Everything is good. Okay, so I'm going to try breakout rooms. Okay, everyone is coming back. So I see smiles on your faces. That's good. Probably some of you liked the task, hopefully. All right, so... We did. You did. That's great. Um, So everyone is back. That's awesome. Um, Okay, so let's do a little reflection. Um, So... Okay, and we kind of talked a little bit about it already, and it will help you with your portfolio. And is there anything else you would do differently next time as a writer or as a student, I don't know, as a teacher? And is there anything you would add to this rubric or task? Maybe the main challenge with this task is like, I, I'm thinking wearing my students' lens because I tried stuff like this with them before. And they will just to, to pick to, they will just avoid the discussion and say, let's pick a knife. So everyone will be say, okay, cool, let's pick a knife. Like, and they're like, can you argue against this choice? They'll be like, no, knife is cool, you know? 
So the, the main challenge for me with this type of activities, they will just find a way to avoid the discussion, you know, to get away without getting involved in the conversation. Yeah, that's, that's, that happens. Uh, sometimes you need some teacher interventions. I've noticed that models and examples are really good. Maybe show them examples of interaction that you find online, I don't know. Uh, move, move people around too, not just use like one group. But yeah, it, does anyone have a suggestion about how to make people interact when they don't want to interact? Well, on one level, you have to teach them how, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to, I mean, we do this with our native speakers too when they're, when they're at an elementary level is we teach them the language to speak to each other about what, uh, to, you know, make effective arguments with each other in a group project or make effective evaluations of each other's choices. So you have to make sure that they actually have the language to express that. Um, otherwise, yeah, they're just going to say yes and move on. Can I add something? Um, I'm just thinking about these movies, and I, I think also we could apply that to different games. Uh, just like um, uh, Bloom's taxonomy, you know, this um, 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 cubic, uh, when they use this Bloom's cubic. <laughs> and to help students to start conversation, just to give them a list of questions or just to start a question. Why? When? Uh, I, you know what I mean? Just to help students to uh, start this conversation. For example, if you're talking about movies, I don't know what to say about movies. Yes, it's cool. I like it. So, but the main hero... And the time when it, uh, uh, you know, just the time of this movie, uh, happy end or not happy end, just to give them some uh, question that will help them to start conversation, to involve. Categories, right? Yeah, that's a great idea. And uh, I'll show you an example. Actually, I have an example. If I don't forget, I'll try not to forget. I have an example of a student who doesn't want to interact and the teacher intervenes. I'll show it to you on Wednesday. If it helps, I don't know. But uh, very good. Sorry, we're a little bit pressed on time. And there is one thing um, that I actually want you to do. I don't know, you, you probably see my screen. So in this workshop, we will be using a relatively new tool. And I think that's the brand new tool of um, that Startalk uses. It's called Catalyst. It's a learning management system. And what you can do in Catalyst, and I'm sorry, another tool for you, but we have to do it. Um, um, Catalyst will help you identify certain things, um, your strengths, goals. In our program, it's optional, so you don't have to do it. But some of the things that you, you'll need are required. So evidence and reflections are required and we'll starting, I think we should be able to post your first reflections and your first piece of evidence on Wednesday. So just gonna Wait, give you- Can we switch? I think we, I only see your Zoom launch meeting right now. Oh, okay. um, not, not, not your- um, presentation. Oh, yeah. Just give me a second. I'm going to do a new share, I guess. Um, you might have to unshare it and share it. Yeah, let me give, give me a second. Yeah. Oh, because I was sharing my first screen. Sorry. Okay. So can you see it now? No? Did, okay. So uh, Catalyst is built around so-called TEL criteria, so teacher effectiveness for language learning framework, and you can dive into this in more detail on your own. Uh, but in a nutshell, these are just things that we as teachers can do. So can you basically, make it bigger, Dima, so that oh, yeah. you can see it a little better? Oh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Let me click present. So for this program, we picked up four criteria four TAU criteria, this is our program. So I can design assessment tests that allow students to perform within the range of their proficiency targets. So this is the second one. I can use performance tasks that allow to demonstrate growth. I can provide students multiple opportunities to demonstrate growth. And I work alongside my students to use rubrics to define performance. So our program is built around these uh, criteria. And by the end of the program, you will upload more evidence that will kind of be in line with this. So that's the plan. And uh, today there's just two things that I want you to do. 
Uh, and uh, first of all, you will need to create a Catalyst account. Uh, so you will need to go to this link and I'm going to send it to you in the chat. If I find the chat, here it is. So this is Catalyst. So you will need to create an account. So I think the easiest for, uh, way to do it is to use your Google account, I think. So go ahead to this link and um, create an account. And if you have questions, just raise your hand or just speak. I don't know, whatever works for you. Uh, may I have a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, do you do we need to join a group? Yes, and I will uh, send you the name of the group. Mm -hmm. right away so this is the group and you i think if even if you type in michigan state university you will see it um and i think you just you will see my groups when you create an account and you just need to click join and you'll find our group uh, what's the access code for the group? Ooh, it's it clap? I think it's clap. Yeah, I think it's clap. Let, let's try clap. Sorry, I always forget. Mm -hmm. Yes, it works. Yes, because we're clap. We start our clap, uh, critical language assessment program. Yeah. Yeah, it worked. It worked? Okay, mm -hmm. awesome. So, so prompted to input an um, access code. Is that access one? code is clap. Uh, just clap. It's in the chat too. It's just clap. Yeah. Thank you, Liz. We have multimodal communication right now going on. So I'm trying to click on join for uh, under my groups, mm -hmm. and um, it doesn't it uh, doesn't ask me about any access code or anything. Is it quick I access? I think first of all you need to type in Michigan State. I think that's the first thing I you need to find. Ask. You need to find the group first, and then type in the access code. I think this is how it works. Did it work this way for others? I think. Seeing some thumbs up, which is a good sign. Always a good sign. Yeah. Everything's good. And if you're having any issues, we'll stay here after this session. We're almost done, uh, but we'll stay for like five to 10 minutes. And if you have any questions, just. Um, and uh, so everyone uh, is a Catalyst user now. Okay. Everyone join our group. You can find our TEL criteria there. Play with it. It's an interesting system. It's like D12, but a little bit more, I guess, user friendly. It has discussions too, which is kind of cool. You can do something like Zoom there, if I'm not mistaken. But I guess we're all tired of Zoom anyway. So that's all. That's it. That's it for today. So um, just create a Catalyst account and join the group. But, and I'm going to, can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Awesome. So at home, and I'm trying to avoid the word homework. We, um, portfolio cover sheet. So the, the, the thing that Paula talked about it. Um, so this is like the first thing, the first part of your portfolio, please refine it. And we will try to upload it to Catalyst on Wednesday. So uh, that's the first thing that you need to do. And you can find, you know, everything is here. Just go to um, um, clap resources. 
you, and you'll find it there. You find your portfolios. You will also find the readings there as well. So this one is the first reading for Wednesday. Um, so we'll have a wonderful guest speaker who's an expert in assessment and TBLT and um, he's just wonderful. And this is the first reading for Wednesday. It's very short, very teacher oriented, very, very friendly. So check it out. And optionally, it would be great. Well, again, it's optional, but if you want to do it, you can go to Catalyst and identify your goals and strengths. You can familiarize yourself with the TEL criteria and see how it works. Maybe you'll find some useful features in Catalyst for your own classes. So um, that's, if I have I forgotten anything? I think that's it. I would just mention to everyone that the reading for um, Kun Van Gorp's talk on Wednesday is in your packet. So if you are tired of reading online, <laughs> you can read the performance assessments to improve student proficiency in your packet. And we will walk you through, um, Dimitri will walk you through how to upload your cover sheet to Catalyst. So all you need to do is refine your cover sheet, finish your cover sheet, uh, and then we will work with you to upload it. The reflection on June 9th, also we will have you do that during uh, the workshop time on um, Wednesday. So Dimitri will also walk you through that. So everyone got for the homework is to finish the cover sheet. And you can do that right in Google Drive. Liz, anything else? Or Dima, anything else? Just that um, we'll be sticking around. We recognize that the two hours is up and that was very fast. Um, but please hang around if you have any questions about what we covered today, um, what we want you to do ahead of the Wednesday session or anything else. Uh, Mona? Yeah, I, it's with the catalyst. Yes. Can, I, um, can I share? Because I have, oh, where did it go? It's not letting me join any group. Um, mm -hmm. uh, okay. okay. Yes. Then. We'll stick around to troubleshoot. If anyone oh, else is that's... done, you can, you can head out and enjoy your evening. And the rest of you, if you have anything to troubleshoot, you can stay on. Thank you for your great questions and comments. Uh, great first day.